Hello. Hello, folks. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to begin our session by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands we are all streaming in from today and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that in Australia we're on stolen land and sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Shannon King. I'm the director of Brisbane Queer Film Festival, streaming in from Mianjin on the lands of Yuggera Turrbal people. And we'd like to welcome you to our Q&A session with the director and cast of Disclosure. This online gathering is made possible with the teams from Queer Screen, Melbourne Queer Film Festival and Brisbane Queer Film Festival. We are truly humbled to be joining together to bring in this live stream. The three of our festivals not only share a love of all things queer cinema and a very close family bond, but also a responsibility to our communities to continue to bring us all together sharing our stories no matter what. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Rhodes. I am the Festival Director for Queer Screen in Sydney. Uh, I just wanted to go through a few little um, housekeeping um, sort of things. So because we wanted to reach the widest audience we possibly could with this um, fantastic uh, Q&A, we, uh, people can watch in multiple ways. So if you are here with us in the, the Zoom webinar, webinar uh, if you have a question that you wanna ask, um, you should see a Q&A box um, that you uh, can click on and ask a question in there so our moderator can see it. Um, please don't post any questions in the chat, um, but you can of course chat to your fellow attendees um, in the chat and create some community. If you're watching the live stream on Facebook, um, then just post any questions that you have within the live stream um, chat box uh, and that will be relayed across to the uh, moderator and if you're watching on Twitter and or not watching on Twitter but following along on Twitter you can uh, on the hashtag disclosure Q&A um, there will be quotes being pulled um, by Melbourne Queer um, and if you have any questions you can use the hashtag or just DM Melbourne Queer Film Festival which is at MQFF and we'll be running the panel uh, to finish up at midday or just before. Hello everyone and thanks Lisa. Uh, my name is Spiro Konomopoulos and I'm the Program Director for the Melbourne Queer Film Festival. Um, I'm here to introduce our moderator for today, Cerise Howard. Cerise is a co-curator at the Melbourne Cinematheque, is also a writer and film critic. Uh, Cerise is also the studio leader at RMIT University, um, specialising in incubating film festivals and contesting the canon. Cerise is also one of the co-founders of TILDA, the trans and gender diverse film festival in Melbourne. And outside of the film world is the basis for queer punk band, Queen Kong and the Homo Sapiens, and was also the bass player for Gender Euphoria during the Melbourne International Arts Festival season in 2019. 2019, oh, how I miss you. Okay, um, that's enough from me and uh, over to Cerise, thank you. Thank you, Spiro. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Shannon. And hello, everyone. And it's a, a real privilege to be here today for this disclosure Q and A. When I say today, I mean uh, Saturday, Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney time. But uh, it is yesterday for all of the guests I am now going to introduce in turn. Um, it is my great pleasure to begin with uh, the director of the uh, documentary Disclosure. In fact, perhaps I should just pull back just one moment. I'll actually just explain. Um, I shouldn't just presume that you've all seen Disclosure. It is uh, readily viewable. It is a, a documentary streaming presently on Netflix. And it looks at uh, issues of uh, representation of trans folk um, uh, historically, uh, presently. Um, and intersectionally, uh, with uh, a special interest on where issues of representation of uh, a marginalised community, uh, which I am most certainly a member myself, um, uh, issues of authenticity and representation, who gets to tell our stories, and how are they received, how have they been received, and, and how do they intersect with uh, other key matters of identity and uh, in, in particular in this documentary, I think race, uh, it's a very timely intersectional view of where things are at with trans representation, uh, especially in, in light of Black Lives Matters and Black Trans Lives Matters events around the world. So I will now throw to the director uh, to introduce to you, the director of Disclosure to start with, uh, Sam Fader. Sam, hi, how are you? 
Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for organizing this panel. It's really nice to be in conversation with you. It's a real pleasure to have you here, Sam. Um, I will now also introduce the producer of the documentary, um, Amy Shoulder. Hi, Amy, how are you? I'm very well, thank you so much for having us. It is all of our great pleasure, thank you. Um, and we also are very fortunate to have uh, three members of the extraordinary cast you were assembled for this documentary. Um, I will introduce, first of all, our actress and writer, um, seen in Tales of the City and web series Her Story, Jen Richards. Hi, Jen. How are you, Jen? Are you muted at the moment. Hi, that's better. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, and joining us all now, um, may I introduce actor, uh, seen in L Word Generation, um, Q and a uh, recent film, Adam, uh, Leo Sheng. Welcome, Leo. Hi. Thanks Hi, Leo. And uh, lastly, but not least, Alexandra Gray, actress and musician, um, seen in Empire and in Transparent, amongst many other roles. Alexandra, hello, how are you? Hi, I'm doing good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Wonderful Hi. to have you all here. We have a tremendous amount to talk about. Um, I think Disclosure is an incredibly timely documentary. Um, whether we could say that that's necessarily a matter of good fortune or, or that there are events in the wider world around us that are not necessarily particularly fortunate, but that have brought to light a, a number of societal ills for, uh, for greater mainstream awareness, I think. I think um, you know, one of the starting points for your documentary is that trans people have never been more visible but with that can also come a, a backlash. And that, that has been a fear for, for, I think, many of us that the, the more confident we become in being ourselves and the more we put ourselves out there, the more risk we might run of encountering uh, resistance to our authentic selves, as sad as that may be. Uh, the, the very title of this film, Disclosure, hints at anxieties around our being ourselves and being open with who we are. Um, Sam, if I may throw to you first, the term disclosure, what, what, what does that mean to you? What, what weight does that term carry for you? The term disclosure really is about this really unfair, like for lack of a better, better word, um, assumption that trans people owe something to the people they're coming in contact with. Um, and most readily that they owe some sort of explanation of who they're showing up as, right? To either explain that they're trans or explain that there's something other than what they're claiming to be and what the person that they're in contact with sees them to be. And as Jen says so beautifully in the film, it really prioritizes the other person's experience and feelings over one's own. Um, and often what we see in film and TV and we also see in off the screen as well is that once there's this moment of disclosure, uh, violence ensues. And um, it's, it's been framed in our culture that this is an acceptable reaction. And that because we've hidden something that needs to be disclosed, then we deserve to be punished for it. And Amy, you're coming on board this project too? Are you coming from a, a similar perspective? Were, uh, and was, it, was it your role in particular to assemble the extraordinary cast in this film? No. Oh, um, <laughs> I came on board this project about um, six months into Sam's work. Um, I, I met Sam through his last film, um, Kate Bornstein is a Queer and Pleasant Danger. I saw it, Sam was at 2014, 2014, when it first was premiering in New York, um, Kate's a, a dear friend of mine and, a, and an author, an author that I work with. I have a background in publishing and have spent my kind of calling in my, my career um, elevating the voices of, of queer and um, uh, underserved storytellers, uh, including Kate and Justin Vivian Bond and Sapphire and June Jordan and Kathy Acker and David Wanarovich and um, have been kind of working to bring their, those storytellers to, to the fore. And when I met 
Sam through his film, which I thought was just extraordinary and beautiful. And if you all haven't seen it, um, you must. Um, it, uh, and then I learned about Sam's next project, which was, which is what became Disclosure. I realized, first of all, how important and necessary this project would be and that it's, it's a history that's never been made. That Sam's kind of vision and integrity and brilliance um, would ensure that this would be um, uh, extraordinarily told. And I uh, was at a point in my life where I was able to say, you know, what can I do? How can I help? And so Sam's team of one became uh, a team of two um, <laughs> when I joined. And, um, and then if, at, a few years later when we met Laverne Cox and she um, wanted to become a creative partner, um, then it became clear that that this was, was going to be um, an extraordinary project and I feel so proud to be part of it. And um, so for example, Jen, uh, how did you come on board this? Uh, was you one of the, um, you know, a very articulate speaker about trans matters and you are, um, I mean, all, all of you um, have enacted um, you know, have, have, I think as a matter of course for many trans performers had to enact roles that um, looking through a historical lens or perhaps I even felt in the moment can't help but be about matters of disclosure and, and that you can't help but perhaps problematize even as you're having to perform them in the quest that we be better understood, uh, that our stories are told, that now that transness is so often the story rather than say a trans character being just incidentally trans. So if I can throw to you perhaps first, Jen, for your, your thoughts on the take of, of how prominent transness, transness is in our, our narratives and, and having to disclose that as a matter of storytelling necessity seemingly. You said it very well uh, in your question. And, and to answer the first part, I was one of the original people that Sam interviewed as part of the research when he was first assembling this film. And I was hyper invested from the start. Many of us who are actors or writers who are in some way involved in the creative industries have to also double as activists, as advocates, just to fight for our own space to do the things that we love. And Sam's uh, film it was evident right from the start was going to be a massive contribution to that conversation and and now I can tell it's even a demarcation point where I feel like everything is now different after disclosure uh, but then what you said is exactly right many of the roles that that I've had to perform I'm sure that Alexandra has had to perform and um, perhaps Leo as well have been ones that where our characters are kind of reduced to their transness that was their only function in there uh, we're often there because our transness is somehow problematized as in Alexandra's cases on several medical shows that she talks about in the film uh, or I was often there uh, in order for a main character to have some kind of moral lesson that my transness had something to do with and that can be done in a good way um, it, it's often very a tactful and artistic. I mean, trans people do have uh, a certain kind of experience that requires a, a degree of self-awareness and interrogation and, you know, battling of external hostilities. Uh, and that can be a, a kind of interesting lesson that a trans person has to uh, to impart onto others. And it can sometimes just be a, a cheap plot point and a, a twist. And so, um, Hopefully it gets better. I think it, I think as the film shows that it's it's certainly getting better. The more that trans people are involved in the creative process, both behind and in front of the camera, the more uh, complex these narratives can become, and the less likely trans people are going to be reduced to that one single aspect of their identity. Yeah, well, Alexandra, you gave a quite, quite um, a couple of quite sort of comical in a gallows humor sort of way uh, examples where you had <laughs> two roles within. Was it even the same day where you had to play yeah. somebody? Yeah, well, yeah, both. I was actually um, like oh, doing a music tour as well that summer. And um, I remember looking at the TV guide and I saw that both of the episodes were airing like the day after each other. So of course, Twitter kind of lit me up. They said, look out for Alexandra Gray because the next role, you know, she's gonna have prostate cancer. So, you know, <laughs> it was uh, it was really, really difficult because I mean, it was one of like the first, you know, one, second gigs that I booked in Hollywood. So. I mean, I'm not in any position to turn anything down. 
Uh, but I also was just so young. I think now I've grown so much as an artist where, you know, the being there, I was so excited it's like oh my gosh this is my one of my first jobs you know so you don't really I wasn't really focused on like wow these storylines are actually the same so um yeah that was that was a bit interesting <laughs> yeah uh, and Leo uh, trans masculine characters are, are more seldom seen this is something that comes up uh, in the documentary quite clearly um do you feel the burden of representation would you would you imagine any greater than your trans feminine colleagues or do you feel that we're all shouldering a similar load um i i think we're all shouldering our own loads and 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 um you know we are definitely we both i think we all carry various parts of responsibility um in different ways um i i think it's it i think it's it's kind of easy to get into like a, a comparison mindset and a lot of like Hollywood storytelling. Like for, so for me, just like background, I, up until maybe last year, I even say 2016, I've lived my life as an audience member. I've lived my life as like a trans person who is also consuming media rather than being part of it. Um, at least in this, in this way, you know, I used to do a lot of writing, um, free writing uh, <laughs> for different platforms. And um, this is the last couple of years is really the only, only, when I started to become aware of it in a way that I wasn't before. So I went from consuming it to being a part of it and like having this double layer of like what goes into it and what it looks like. Um, and what I feel like I say, or like what I what I think about a lot is that when I filmed my first role at all, it was, it was in 2016 and like late 2016 and the OA I believe had aired, but it, it hadn't gained the, I think fan base that season two brought. Um, and so, Ian Alexander, Chella Mann, Skylar Baylor, like these are names that I think in the last couple of years, people have really started to, to see and like see like Asian trans men exist, Asian trans men of tra or Asian folks of trans masculine experience. Um, and I also want to point out Kit Yan, who is probably more known in like, like uh, literary writing circles probably. Um, but for me, like it's really hard to separate trans masculine representation from Asian trans masculine representation because that's, that's what I'm bringing. That's kind of, it's an inherent piece of me. It's not really a skill because it's just who I am, but it's what I'm bringing with me to every job, every audition, every pitch or whatever I'm, I'm, it's given to me. And so I keep that in mind. I definitely keep that in mind with when I'm, when I'm presented with something. Um, I've turned a few things down when I didn't think that they would end well. <laughs> or I didn't think that they would portray things in a way that I would, that I'm hoping to portray trans masculine folks um, in my, in my experience and in my, my line of, my trajectory. Um, and so I guess just to answer your question, I do feel like there's a lot of pressure. I feel like um, with the L word, um, that's something we've talked about from the very beginning is understanding that uh, although there is an increase in trans masculine representation, there's still going to be a lot of people for whom this is the first entryway into trans masculine storylines or storytelling. And so how are we going about it in a way that is acknowledging of the fact that Mike is, my character Mike is experiences are not, um, cannot be applicable to like every Asian trans person. Um, and so it's very much a fine line of, of wanting to be responsible and also just trying to figure out the best thing in the moment and that'll, that'll carry on in a, a good way, hopefully. Well, Sam, if I can throw back to you. So there's this, you know, this question and everyone here feels it, I don't doubt this question of responsibility and a, a sense that Yes, we need more positive representation of trans and gender diverse peoples. And yet, I think to really arrive at a, a maturity as a culture or as, um, you know, this might sound utopian, but a lot of the problematic depictions that we all grew up with and sometimes first identified ourselves as trans through are perhaps the sort of villain, uh, the, the, you know, say villainous roles or um, you know, the, the full breadth of uh, performance and, and representation and depiction is kind of denied to us, arguably, while we try to make sure that there's a, enough positive representation in the first is, instance of, of our marginalized selves. Uh, I think you more than touch on this in, in the film. You, you look at a lot of historical uh, footage and going back even to early, early cinema, um, and uh, you know, how, how do you feel about that responsibility? Uh, do, do you feel that, that, that burden upon you as a filmmaker telling such a story that is looking through all the history of representation of trans people 
and and where it is intersected with race, uh, do you really um, does does that bear down upon you? Okay, you're muted. Sorry, Sam. You were breaking up a little bit, so I just didn't get the actual question. If you could restate the question again. Oh, sure. Um, uh, just with the the. The, the thirst we all have for positive representation of trans people, um, perhaps there's also a thirst for a breadth of uh, representation in, in as much as that, you know, maybe it would be wonderful if we could be serial killers again. You know, that sounds perverse perhaps, but while we still need that positive representation to remove a lot of stereotypes and, and damaging images that have gone before, the, before us, um, for as long as we still need cheerleading roles, perhaps we, we cannot arrive at a maturity as a culture until we, we are able to actually uh, once more present uh, a, a, well, a gamut of mm -hmm. identities and possibilities for characterizations. Do you feel that? Um, do, I, do I feel that? <laughs> um, you know, so um, let's see. Uh, do you want me to jump in, Sam? I think I know what. Well, you know, you know, I think what Jen has a beautiful line in the film where she talks about um, the one the one word answer to the problem of representation is more, right? We just need more. And then if we have more representation, the clumsy representations, the clumsy moments wouldn't, you know, be as damaging. Um, but I, you know, I, I often remember when I, when people are talking about this issue of, you know, whether we need, you know, the, the we want all the stories, I, I can't help but think about the conversations that were happening when I was in undergrad in the early 90s, where people were questioning women's studies departments. And I don't mean changing women's studies to gender studies. This is way before even that debate. Just why have a women's studies department? Why have, you know, an African or a black studies department, right? Everything should just be history. And it was, it was this idea that was ignoring the power dynamic of our culture, right? And so it's, you can't, you, you can't have this ideal version that this, that we're going to include everyone in our history when our culture doesn't operate that way. So it's a similar conversation of until there is some semblance of trans people having some power in this culture or being centered, you know, or being given the opportunities to tell their own stories, like there is gonna be this huge amount of pressure. There is a huge amount of responsibility of every representation that we see. Um, you know, and I think one easy, easy trick when you're watching a television show is to say, is anything happening to that person that doesn't have to do with them being trans? And usually you're gonna walk away with saying, oh, everything, I mean, like I think of that beautiful film, A Fantastic Woman, beautiful, but every single thing that happened to her was because she was trans. And so for me, like I walked out of that movie feeling like, okay, we, we haven't, I don't, everyone's happy because a non-trans person can watch this and feel bad for her and then feel good for her themselves, right? It had that sort of access of empathy and, Victimhood and pity, which I actually do not think is progress. And so until we start to see characters that, you know, I mean, I, I do my laundry, you know, I go to the farmer's market, like those things have nothing to do with me being trans. So I think that when we're talking about the responsibility, like that, that is the first step I'd like to see before we say, you know, let's see all the roles. Let's see the serial killer. Not yeah. ready for that yet. Yeah. So Jen, Jen, did you want to add to that? Well, I mean, you, you, you said it perfectly, Sam, which is the same thing. It's, it's a matter of the trans people having power in, in those moments. Part of, it, it's not just that, you know, there was this, this rash of, of trans people portrayed as serial killers. It's that those stories were written, directed, produced, performed, <laughs> marketed to trans, you know, non-trans people. That, that trans people were not part of that equation whatsoever. I would love to play a villain. I would love to write a villain. I would love to write those complicated characters. It's not a matter of just having positive portrayals. It's a matter of our agency and our power in the system. Yeah, terrific. I, um, all right, um, and on, on that, you know, uh, bouncing off that, there was, it came up for a number of people that part of their identification uh, in, in the part of their self-identification, their uh, coming to awareness as being trans was through only seeing those quite negative representations at first. And there's that really interesting tension between people seeing like um, uh, 
uh, you know, Dress to Kill was an example in, in the, the film, you know, this Brian De Palma slasher flick with uh, Angie Dickinson perishing because Michael Caine inexplicably suddenly you know, dressed in drag uh, murders her, you know, as, as happens. Um, so, and yet a sense of, oh, but, you know, she was, you know, I'm Angie. Um, I, I, I too grew up with such um, problematic identifications. I, I, I wonder if, if the, the rest of you felt that as acutely as, as well. Is that something that you are mindful of in, in those times when you have had, you have been cast in, in roles, for example, Alexandra, um, you know, when you've, you have been consigned to being a character perishing in hospital again, or um, you know, the, the, the victim trope is, is very common in trans narratives, um, whether it's directly associated with the transition as being perilous to a human being or just simply being. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it kind of works in like, in like two ways, right? I think um, I was having this conversation with someone the other day and I was just saying, I wonder if we didn't have like 30 seasons of Jerry Springer, I wonder if the perception of everyone else of trans people would be a lot different, right? Like, so, and I think that's what's obviously so important about, about this film too, is that it, it, the media has played such a, a major part in how people view us. You know what I mean? They, I mean, they're just negative portrayals all the time. And if all you see, even in 2016, back when I did that, are, are, is me playing a, a cancer patient who has prostate cancer, right? You know what I mean? And I'm, and I'm, I'm super grateful, right? Like, I'm, I want to be very clear about that, right? But we, we have to, you know, talk about these things. <laughs> so I, I think that it's like the negative, the, the, the negative portrayals just, just, they don't help, right? I can't speak for myself, right? I have had a very different upbringing, right? So for me, I didn't even, couldn't even deal with being trans because I was too busy dodging bullets. So, um, you know, but for someone else coming up now, right, where, where, where this conversation is moving, you know, uh, they are looking to, towards the media, right? And I'm so glad that we, we are starting to get it right. And we have shows that are showing positive portrayals, but we just need more. Right, like, and and my my part is, is I have to speak on behalf of of girls that look like me, right? The black trans woman, right? Because we get murdered a lot, and so it's like I don't see enough of us, right? You know what I mean? Like, I I, I know we got a lot of trans characters, a lot of diversity. We're really doing really good, but I need to see more, right? I need to see the the black trans doctor, the black trans preacher, the black trans mom, I need to see all of this type of stuff. So it's like, we have to do more because people have to, they won't start to see us as quote unquote normal, but you know, unless they can see it. And I'll just say this one little point is that I have a lot of cis friends, right? And, you know, I was hanging out with one of my, my cis guy friends and, uh, you know, he had brought up Laverne Cox, you know, and he had said, you know, she's a boss, you know, like he had so much respect for her, right? And you know, I was, I was just like, and I, and I wonder what, if, if more people got to see us be a boss, right, or whatever you want to call it, or just be normal, I wonder if that perception might not be, be different, right, and people might be like, yo, these are just people, so. Yeah, well, all of you have had to combine, uh, you know, you don't really get a choice, activism with your roles in the creative industries. Um, you know, do you, if I'll, I'll cross to you in this case, Leo. Um, do you feel that that tension between um, uh, an obligation um, to community and to positive representation, but do you ever feel a tension with that, with you know, perhaps even a resentment that we as a, a community have to do all that heavy lifting, that our allies, um, whoever they may be, are not doing it for us. I mean, that, I, I, do, you, do you feel that at all or is that, is that just me? Uh, I'm smiling really hard and my heart's pounding a lot because I had I got a little Twitter thread on this the other day um, where I was just kind of giving a very vague, very, you know, quick overview of the fact that like, being a Chinese trans guy in Hollywood is fucking weird. To say even, even to say that I'm in Hollywood is really weird to me, but um, it's, 
You know, I think, you know, Alexander made a really good point about having, feeling gratitude towards roles that have um, in many ways or and, and may have, you know, guided us to where we are now. And so I um, think a lot about when I took my first role and the things I've learned since then. And, and this is something that I've talked about in many trans circles and there is a lot of controversy around Adam and there still is. Um, and I think your question feels very applicable to this because um, there were a lot of trans folks who enjoyed the film and felt like it was very representative of a certain time period um, in certain circles. And there were folks who didn't feel that way and felt like it really misrepresented trans folks and that um, there are a few more issues with it. Um, and it's something like, obviously I can't ignore, like, yes, I'm grateful to Reese for giving me a chance. I had no acting experience. And I think it's important that we like acknowledge that, that you know, it, it, it goes with your question and it goes with um, something Drew Gregory from Autostraddle said very well, is that representation will feel different for everybody. Some folks may love something, some folks may not. <laughs> and so that's part of, I think that's part of this obligation is, is kind of never really, it's kind of, you know, trying to find the right direction and where community is saying that we should be. And also like doing what I can with what I'm being given and, and have opportunity and access to. Um, and I think, I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, for me, I'm in the very many fair criticisms I'm getting, what I notice is like, it's coming from predominantly like white trans masculine people. And I'm like, well, why am I the only one, the only like visible trans person of color from that film getting this? I'm then being told it's my responsibility to, to speak for this entire film. Sorry, I'm really nervous talking about this, like this upfront about it. I have not done it like this before. Um, and it's, so it great. is, it, it's, <laughs> Think them. Um, it it's it it butts heads with my identity as a trans person, but as an Asian trans person, very much. I think there are a lot of hopes and a lot of expectations and fears and just a lot of desires put onto trans representation. And there's still such a disconnect between the, the ways that race and um, and ability status and um, I'm every other marginalized identity that plays in with gender um, has plays into that. And so that's something I do think about a lot. Um, my obligation to broader trans representation, but my obligation to people who also share more similar identities with me. Um, and so I think to answer your question, and it's complicated, and um, but it's important work and it's important to have these conversations. I just, I wish and hope that there was more of an understanding and like examination of that for certain community folks. Yeah. I'm going to, um, I've got a few questions coming in through the, the Q&A and I'll, I'll start throwing some of these. So here's a good one, perhaps for, for Sam and Amy to begin with. Um, been asked by a, a, a cadence bell. Uh, my trans collaborators and I experienced intimidation, gaslighting and sexual harassment on a production recently. Do you think such experiences are fundamentally different from other Me Too experiences given trans people have to fight harder for representation. Amy? Well, um, I'm gonna sidestep that question a little bit to talk about our production model because it was a commitment that we made um, at the outset of the film um, and it's related to this question. So. Um, which was that Sam said to me early on, I want our production crew to be trans. And um, I said, okay, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Why not? That shouldn't be hard. Um, and, and, and then we proceeded to stick to that um, goal. When we couldn't hire a trans person, then we would hire a cis person to mentor. Uh, we would have, we had a fellowship program and that cis person mentored. Um, a trans person who wanted to um, have on the job experience. We um, compensated everyone as best we could. And that was really a, a, a part of our process that we thought would make a better film. Um, we also thought that it would help with this whole notion of like, well, what, you know, how can trans people tell their own stories if they haven't had the work experience and the opportunities. So we would 
try to give those opportunities. Um, and, and, you know, most gratifying was that we had this incredible experience on set, which was that there wasn't harassment and there wasn't violence um, and there wasn't um, disregard and insensitivity. Um, and there was instead learning and talking and discussion. And, um, and when there was some kind of conflict or difficulty or challenge um, or insensitivity, there was an atmosphere to address it. And I feel really proud of that. Um, and I feel like we provided an opportunity for people to work in a kind of violence-free zone that was clearly unusual for a lot of folks. And, um, and I, uh, I encourage everyone who's listening, if you're a maker, to think about you know, what's the subject of your film and who's behind the camera and how can you make kind of sense of who you hire to make a film with what you're making the film about and not to listen to, to plenty of folks said to Sam and me, oh, you know, that's a nice idea to hire trans people, but uh, you know, you really want to hire the best people and, you know, to like, not dignify that response with like an argument, but just to move on and realize they don't get it. Um, and instead to stick to the values around um, the making and process and how that process is really going to be reflected in, in um, all aspects of, of the work that, that you all will see when you see with this work. Yeah, Sam, I see in the disclosure press kit, it, you wrote very clearly that, um, that you and Amy committed to four rules in your process and rule one was only trans people are featured in the interviews, they are creative consultants and will be paid for their time. Um, this is a, a key ethical platform just as, you know, point one. Um, this is important, right? Yeah, I mean, for the two of those things, one, trans people are the experts in their own histories, right, and their own experiences and their memories and perspectives and you're telling a story about trans people no one else should really be talking about or for us, for them. Um, and also, you know, when it comes to documentary filmmaking, there's such a history of not paying the participants because somehow that, you know, cancels out the integrity or the honesty of the film. And it's, it's some sort of leftover imperial sort of like journalistic farce uh, that just doesn't apply to documentary filmmaking because there's so much editorial that happens no matter what you do. Um, so, I, and I mean, it goes for, I think anyone who's part of a documentary, but in particular, when you're making a documentary about a marginalized community where people could be spending their time making money, but you're gonna have them, you know, make your film with you and not compensate them for their time. I think it's just highly, unethical and it's something I've always done. I've always paid the people I work with for the past 17 years. Um, in the beginning, I didn't have the budget, but if, after the film started to make some money, I then compensated the people I've worked with. Um, and I get a lot of pushback. Um, the documentary community is not happy about this. Funders do not support that in your budget. Um, Amy and I had to explain a lot of, like really explain and bent over backwards explaining why we thought this was important. Um, I'd really like to see that change in the industry. I think it should be a given that the people who die were in your film. And I think directors should be fighting for it first and foremost. I mean, regardless of whether a director makes any money off a project, they get cultural capital. That's just inherent, that's happening. So I just, that's, for me, it's a no brainer that your participants should be paid. Great, thank you. Um, another question from Addy Close. Um, Addy writes, I'm an actor. And I've seen some problematic examples used in classes and lectures by teachers and industry professionals. I'm trying to find the best way to approach these situations in an educational environment. How do we as students educate our teachers and make these environments a safe in and inclusive space? It's quite a curly one. Would anyone like to chime in on, on that particular conundrum? Educate, have the need to educate teachers? as to what, what is a safe and inclusive space for trans folk. Because somehow it's often incumbent upon us to do that heavy lifting. Leo, you look like you're going yeah. to this. Um, I just, well, I think it's, I think it's a really good question because I have definitely been in 
you know, queer centered classes. I was, you know, for folks who don't know, I was in my first year of grad school for social work, um, which is also another issue, but uh, also with instructors who were rather insensitive or just like not aware of certain things. And I think that's a really, really, really difficult position to be in like as, I just want to validate, I think mostly I just want to validate that that is really a difficult position. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously my, my, always, my go-to always is like talk to Glad, but I don't know what that would look like in like a, a different various non-media specific types of situations or um, across yeah. environments. I think, I, I, I just want to validate that I, I feel like that's hard when people who are supposed to be educating you on something um, will misspeak or say really, really not great things. I don't know. Beyond that, I'm sorry. You can have you can have them watch disclosure now. That like that's one I mean, very simple thing that people can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so great for us to have this tool. I mean, I there have been several times where I took auditions, even though I did not want the part, like where it was a problematic part, just so that I could get in the room and tell the casting director, tell the director, like this isn't good. Like this is a bad thing that you are doing. You think you're helping by like a trans character, and you're actually hurting us with this particular depiction. You need to talk to trans people. Um, but no one should have to take that on themselves. Like I had the privilege of being able to do that is because of my age and because I'm white and because I make my living mostly from writing. <laughs> so I could go in and be as an actor just like, no, this is bad. Um, so when you have that opportunity to speak out for other people, take it. If you feel the strength and you can make things better for the next person behind you, go for it. But also, you know, like Leo is recognizing, it's, that's a really hard position and it isn't always going to be on you and it doesn't need to be. Yeah, I mean, the, the question was uh, about classrooms, but really it's, it's, it's also about being on, the, the same situation must come up on set any number of times in your careers um, where you end up having to educate the very people who are employing you. Um, and, you know, the power dynamic there isn't necessarily one that gives you a tremendous amount of obvious leverage. Um, so I suppose appeals to common human decency, are, you know, the power of the currency you have to employ there. Um, a tricky, tricky situation, I, I should imagine. Um, I'll take an, another, uh, uh, is a question from an, an anonymous attendee who has noted that the wonderful Jamie Clayton has probably played the most famous trans lesbian role on Sense8, and was recently revealed that her lesbian character on the new L Word is Cis, which is fab and a great place for us to be, but as trans lesbians are so underrepresented, do you think it's paramount that trans actors play diverse trans roles before the utopia of any roles uh, so people can feel represented? Um, Alexandra, would you like to chime in there? Well, I guess um, I'm, I love playing trans roles. I, I love it. You know, I always will, will definitely play those. And I think it's very important. Um, you know, I did a movie um, last, you know, last year where I, I play trans and, um, you know, I just, I, I, I think it's a little, little tricky, right? I definitely think we need to, to have trans roles, right? So because trans people exist in the world. Um, but at the same token, it's like, I think we just need to be, we would just, we just want to be a part, right? Uh, we're normal people as well. So I, I think it's important to note that if you were to cast, you know, myself or Jen Richards uh, to play, you know, sis, I, I, I hope I'm saying the right terms because, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I didn't go to college. Um, so, you know, I, um, if you cast Jen to play sis, right, it's like, just, just, you know, maybe, maybe mention that, you know, is a, a trans person who's playing cis, right? One time, right? Mission at one time. So that people know, and then people will just know that, well, Jen Richards is a star. We, we know that she is trans, but she's an actress. And so we just see her as an actress. So it doesn't matter what she plays. And I think that's, that's the goal to get to. So I think, you know, it, we should have a, a good balance of both, right? We should still write trans stories, um, but, you know, we should also cast trans people to play any, any, any type of roles, even if they are unconventional and it's like, Alexandra can't have a child, but I could play a mother, you know what I mean? So it's like, why not do that, right? Like just that's the whole thing. And, um, you know, we, we let's just be inclusive all around. Can I jump in on this one? Um, 
I can't help but think about when this conversation comes up is again, going back to power dynamics. It wouldn't even be an issue if trans wasn't seen as lesser than, right? Like, and Jen often talks about like, no matter what she's cast at, she's still a trans person playing the role. Like the character is trans no matter what. And I feel like if the center gaze wasn't cis, straight, hetero, maleness, like this wouldn't even be a conversation. So I just question this, this goal of playing cis as like, it's just kind of perpetuating this power dynamic that's not helping any of us. There's a real complexity there, I think, because um, it's very clear. And I, I, I'm, well, I, I know we are not monolithic in our, our views and that's something we always do need to get a, across, but um, I think generally where there's a pretty wide feeling that we don't want cisgender actors playing trans roles, that that is too loaded and, and the, the historically um, that has often been egregiously awful um, and, and deprives trans performers from work, of work. Um, so yes, the, the question of whether it would be utopian that someone's transness can be narratively disappeared in order for them to embody a cisgender character it's, it's genuinely a, a curly one. Is, is it a utopia or is that, is that strangely dystopian that we should be erased, that transness should be erased? Yeah, I don't, I don't ever want my transness being erased. I just don't want to be reduced to it. You know, I mean, I always joke that unless you see my character like actually giving birth, she's trans. Like I just, and I, I've had plenty of parts where the character's gender identity is never mentioned. It's never made explicit. And people, and some people will be like, oh, she's playing a cis character. Like, and, and that's the kind of cis normative thing that Sam's just pointing out. The assumption is like, unless you explicitly point out that my character is trans, she's somehow magically cis. Like, no, like that's cis normativity. That's just the assumption that cis is the default. As far as I'm concerned, like that my transness can never be erased and I don't want it to be, um, unless I was maybe playing a historical character. But I mean, trans people are fascinating. We're really interesting, wonderful people. I want to play trans characters. <laughs> I want to play us in our full complexity and, and wonder. I'll throw to another question. Oh, you know what, before, yeah, I just want to, you know, Jen, we were, we, this question comes up all the time and Jen and I do a lot of press together. And I think it was just yesterday, you talked about the sort of breakdown of the three issues around casting. And you talked about, you know, economic, I'd love that. Would you share that? Yeah, okay, real quickly, the, the issue with, with casting cis people as trans people, it, it's not a simple thing. Like in, in the best of all worlds, I would love for anyone to be able to play anyone. Like as an artist, I, I think I want that kind of freedom both for myself and others, but we don't live in that ideal world. So there's, um, there's a, a kind of economic reason to do it, which is trans people need a foothold in the industry. We, we need to get jobs, like we can never get the kind of leading roles that are about, you know, that have great trans characters if we can't play barista number two and, and like all the other roles, you know, be, behind the scenes. There is a political uh, reason uh, in that when you cast cis men in particular as, as trans women, you are reinforcing this notion, a very dangerous notion in the public mind that trans women are ultimately men at the end of the day, uh, which, which leads to violence. Um, but there's also a, a simple aesthetic reason, which is when a cis person plays a trans character, it, they're often playing the transness, like that's the part that's interesting to them. And then again, it's a reductive performance. Whereas when a trans person plays that part, the transness is a given. So they get to play the story, they get to play the character, they get to play the relationship dynamics. So there's multiple reasons why we need to include trans people in those opportunities. Very well said, thank you. Um, uh, a question from, uh, a couple of questions from Adeline Teo. Uh, how do Hollywood beauty standards affect the kinds of trans stories being produced by cis media makers? Do you think trans media makers use these standards in the same way, wittingly or unwittingly? Sam or Amy, can I throw to you one or other of you if you'd like to tackle? I mean, trans that? people are not immune to making huge mistakes <laughs> and to doing horrible things. So of course, I mean, there aren't that many trans people getting opportunities to make work. But I think just the first and foremost answer to that question is, of course. <laughs> I don't know, if, like, Amy, do you have a, a deeper? So Amy, you, yeah. 
No, I don't have a deeper response. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I know, Jen, that you have um, and expressed a really important kind of point about armor, about adornment and um, beauty standards for women and trans women in film um, that is a, an important part of, of disclosure. Is there, could you summarize it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no, a great part in disclosure that you can watch. I think it's about 43 minutes. <laughs> Um, it, it, it's, it's really, a, it, I think that it's a complicated point and I do um, hope your viewers will kind of tune into this part of disclosure where this very um, kind of complicated issue is addressed about um, uh, standards of beauty and where they come from and who should really be um, responsible for how, you know, especially how we think about femininity in particular. Um. But also, let's, I mean, this is, it's Hollywood. Hollywood likes beautiful people across the board. Like that's always been true. It, it's always going to be true. I, ideally, yes, there's room for everybody and, and we wanna see all kinds of stories told. And, and the more that trans people are established, the more opportunities those will be. But yeah, absolutely. The, the, your top people are usually gonna be your most beautiful people. That's just, that's Western culture. We're a very visual culture. We, we have been since Mycenaean Greece and, and early Egypt. Like it's in our DNA at this point. <laughs> I think too, it, it's like, I don't know, maybe it's a given, but I just, I feel like, you know, the standards, Western standards of beauty, specifically Western standards of beauty um, are also very tied to like cis normativity and like the ways I think you often see when trans people are cast, I think casting directors with whatever their intentions are end up casting people who often could be perceived as cis as well. And I think that's something unless, um, you know, and, and, and if they're, you know, and if I think this goes to what Jen was saying about when you have cis men playing trans women, like it plays with this idea of transness and like this performative aspect and like having audiences being like, Ooh, what is happening? You know, I think that's an unfortunate choice that a lot of that happens in a lot of places where, if the storyline is somebody who may be early in their medical transition, casting directors make really messy choices. And, and it, it, it relies on this idea that like people who are cis passing then are inherently more beautiful somehow in Hollywood's eyes. And that's the story they wanna tell because then also they can like ignore the person's transness or character's transness in a way that, I don't know. I, don't think I, I mean, it's- an yeah, Alexander. I mean, because I know Alexander has been told she doesn't look trans enough to play trans parts. Yeah, yeah. It, like super early on, like in my career, it was. I mean, honestly, I think because a lot of the scripts changed on on some of the shows that I worked on, and it it turned out to be a thing where it's like, okay, we're going to reveal. Like that's my thing. Like shows love to reveal that I'm trans, um, and. It's just like, I, I just kept hearing, I mean, there was been so many auditions and roles where I'm like, well, she's not, she's not trans enough. And, you know, I'm just like, I, I don't know, what, what do you mean? You know what I mean? And so I would hear that, that a lot, you know, that I wasn't trans enough. So, I mean, I don't know, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm still working my way through. I, ha I haven't been a series regular yet or anything like that. And, you know, I'm gorgeous, <laughs> but I think that, you know, so I don't know, like, does that, does that play a part, right? Like, I, I, I don't know, right? I can't say from my experience that it's helped me at all. Um, it's actually, I think, hurt me in a lot of ways. But, you know, I wouldn't change anything. But I think for sure that I, I've heard that several times and I've been turned down from projects and I haven't even been allowed to audition for certain things because they're like, well, she's too passable. So, yeah. <laughs> There was an interesting conversation where in a scene on the, like early on in the L word, because folks who are familiar with the L word, lots of shirtless stuff going on, lots of, lots of body showing. Um, I, for me, as a, like in my, in my medical journey, I had a type of top surgery that does not leave the kind of scars that I think many people are familiar with. And that was a conversation we had, like, is somebody going to know by like looking at my chest 
because in, I, I acknowledge like I am often perceived as cis. And so like, if that would have been maybe, maybe a, a telltale, tell, whatever, that would have been a tell. Um, and that was something that we, it was an interesting conversation to be a part of. I think like ultimately we did not choose to like add any sort of fake scarring because that's not genuine. Um, but I mean, like, I think it's such an interesting thought process. Like I can't fully understand it. I get it like from like, I logistically, I get it, but like, I can't understand the, the, that, that to me, it's, it, I don't know. It's so weird. Can I just add that I think what it is, right. And this is just my, you know, assumption based off my experiences. I think that people, I don't know if you want to say producers, showrunners, I'm not sure. Right. I think they look at an actress like myself and it's like, okay, if we put, if we cast her in this trans role, what's going to be interesting about that, right? It's like, because she doesn't read as trans or visibly trans, whatever that means, right? It's like, so what would make Alexandra Gray interesting on this show, right? And it's like, well, I don't know, you know, maybe put it in the writing, right? Like it's writing and, that, and it talks about, I'm transitioning or wherever you want to write, you know what I mean? It's like, then it doesn't have to be the, the, the shock factor of like seeing me, whatever. Like, I feel like that's the perception is that it's like, if the audience cannot tell that this person is, was either this way or that way, it's like, then it's not like, it's not really interesting. It's like, but I think I got blessed because it was like, well, she was probably the best actress for that role. So we got a caster, so, you know, I mean, it just, we're moving in a more positive direction. Thank you. Um, we're really close to being out of time. Um, uh, more questions, episode. we love questions, more questions. You're happy to continue? I am, I can talk all night. <laughs> <laughs> all right well I'll, I'll just check that i'm not about to get out of the word to, to wrap this thing up but i hope not because um you know there are plenty of other questions too that have come in um so at least I'll, I'll throw to at least one more right now um and this is one i like and it's addressed uh, to some extent in the film uh from annie lewis uh, when we discuss allyship we are often referring to cis or straight people but do you think other members of the LGBTQIPA community could learn how to be better allies to trans people? Leo? I don't know. Who wants to take it? Just, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> the short answer is yes. I think, really. I think, I think, what, I think, you know, it's, either not a secret or people, some folks are okay with the transphobia and biphobia and and erasure of certain identities and queer communities. And it's, uh, it's dangerous and it really kind of takes away from this idea of sense of community for me. Um, and so I would say, yeah, I think I'd say being like a cis queer person doesn't automatically make you an ally to trans folks or mean that like, you know, you accept this. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I don't know. Y'all have thoughts? <laughs> well, I think, you know, Yancey says um, really um, succinctly in Disclosure how, you know, for a lot of, um, a lot of gay and lesbian people, um, the, the movement has been about assimilation or the goal has been assimilation. And, and you know, I think for that part of the gay and lesbian community, then transness is, you know, a kind of, you know, it, it is, it's not part of what they care about. Um, and, um, and, you know, and then, so I think that this idea that we're all like in, you know, some big tent together is really not accurate. I think you really have to care about, um, about, trans people, you have to care about all people, you know, you, you know, I think just by being gay or lesbian or bisexual does not mean you're necessarily progressive or you understand um, uh, who is left out and care about who is left out. So um, I, I think in a way that, you know, allyship is really about caring about about everyone, including everyone in consideration of the quality 
um, not just those who can assimilate. Perhaps a good starting point would be um, in this question uh, from Mike Worsley, uh, who asks, how important is it to have a trans writer slash producer slash director working on a production that features trans characters? Uh, often we see issues portrayed and discussed without a trans person consulted. Is this just as important as casting trans people in trans roles? And this to me is a question of allyship. Um, perhaps it is to you as well. The importance of trans consultancy in trans storytelling? Sam? <laughs> um, you know, we credit our, our cast as creative consultants, but there's a line in the film where Trace Lissette talks about how you need to give trans people more credit, not just as consultants. <laughs> and, and we just love that because it's so true. Um, I think it's different in our situation, but um, so often we've seen projects credit trans people as consultants and it's just, that's all they get. It's just the credit. Like there's, they have not taken the, the notes, the advice that that trans person has given. So um, again, until we see the power dynamic shifting, I think it is absolutely crucial that there's trans people behind the scenes. Because um, by the time it gets to casting, so much harm has already been done, you know, from the script to the directing, to the framing, to the lighting. I mean, we just know that there's a certain sensitivity you have in how you tell a story when you have a stake in it, right? When you have something on the line. And so, for example, there were particular details that my DP would only pick up on, my director of photography, because she was trans. Like there's just certain sensitivities she had and how, you know, we showed our cast on screen. So I think that that can't be replaced uh, by anything else. Um, and until you give money to trans people, hire trans people, that's not gonna change. All right, well, I, I do have a sense that I ought to wrap this up soon and not keep you all over long, but um, perhaps I can uh, pose this question courtesy of Taylor Kugel, who has asked, are you looking at creating a sequel to this uh, and are you considering ex um, expanding the scope into the history or impact of trans people in everyday work who may or may not be in a gender diverse workplace or one with policies and procedures to manage gender diversity? That's quite some undertaking, I think. But, um, but maybe, it, can I even just throw to you as well just the idea of, is there a, a sequel, possibly even a mini series to look at the history of representation uh, more broadly outside of, um, uh, Hollywood and uh, you know, go cast the net further afield. Would you be up for that challenge, Sam, Amy? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Leo, Alexandra. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think it's just all important. I think the film itself is super, super important, and it's something that we definitely need. Um, I think that it's already make, making a huge difference. Uh, a lot of casting directors have reached out to me uh, personally and um, just expressed, you know, some th their thoughts about it and, and how beautiful the film was. And, um, you know, the roles have been coming through, honey. Okay. Um, in terms of, you know, like the auditions, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm getting all types of auditions coming through that, that I'm like, yes, finally, you know, uh, and I think all of that is, is credit to uh, this film and, and its popularity and, you know, the honesty. And um, so I think it's so important. And I would love to see, you know, a miniseries. I know I've been hearing that. Um, you know, I would love to see uh, even even more. But I think this really, you know, hits the nail, the ham hits the, um, what I'm trying to say. It hits the thing on the nail with this. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Obviously, I agree. Um, and I, 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 I know you all gathered so much footage and I just, I, I continuously, I've, I've seen it three times and uh, I, I watched the trailer at once a day, once not, if not once every other day, just because it just, there's something about it that just feels like I feel it in my chest. And so to see, just to know the work you all put into it, if there's ever a miniseries or anything, I know that would be incredible. And then it's incredible as a standalone too. I think y'all just, it's, it's, it's breathtaking. My dream now for the miniseries, and I'm just gonna talk it into 
uh, I'm just going to manifest it, yeah, um, it, is that, so we, we collected over 600 television titles, 400 film titles, and have hours and hours and hours of interview footage. So we wouldn't even need to, we could even create a lot from just the material we have now. But I would love to do more interviews because there's so many other people that have so much to contribute to this conversation. But what my dream is, is to hire five different trans directors and, and, and oversee that process and have different directors direct each episode. I think that would be really awesome. And then of course, whole crews for each of those episodes that would prioritize trans crew people as well. That's my dream. So any funders who are psyched about that. Yeah. All right, well, uh, that's a wonderful note to end on, a note of uh, optimism that um, there may be more so much more yet to come. But in the meantime, uh, disclosure is a, a, a real treat for um, all folk who can readily access it on Netflix. Um, watch it, watch it again, learn, pay attention. And you folk out there in the wider world, getting ready for your next production, employ trans folk, employ them in every role. Um, and, uh, I, I must thank uh, Queer Screen, uh, Melbourne Queer Film Festival and Brisbane Queer Film Festival for making this conversation possible. Um, uh, most of all, uh, I must thank uh, my extraordinary guests here today. So thank you so much, Sam Fader, Director of Disclosure, Amy Shoulder, Producer of Disclosure, and prominent, wonderful uh, cast members of that wonderful um, documentary and uh, who you can catch in so many other shows and uh, moving image works besides Jen Richards, Leo Sheng and Alexandra Gray. And perhaps everyone might like just to quickly flood the chat with uh, little claps of you know, some sort of feedback that you can give that we might all be able to see just so that we know that you're all appreciative. That would be a lovely parting gesture from you, the audience here live in the moment, to um, this wonderful assemblage of magnificent talent. Um, thanks everyone for your time and uh, I look forward to seeing whatever comes next from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Yeah.